20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell writes in 1919, "Mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth but supreme beauty, a beauty cold and austere like that of a sculpture, without appeal to any part of our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music, yet sublimely pure and capable of a stern perfection such as only the greatest art can show." The true spirit of delight, the exaltation, the sense of being more than man, which is the touchstone of the highest excellence, is to be found in mathematics as surely as poetry. Large areas of the brain are activated when viewing numbers, equations, and geometries. When we consider something as beautiful, an emotional part of the brain called the medial orbital frontal cortex is activated in a similar response as listening to music or looking at a painting. Take for examples the number zero. Is zero beautiful? Zero can denote an empty space, like in 2009, or can be an actual entity, like the amount zero. The Romans did not need zero because they write in Roman numerals. The Babylonians used two vertical wedges to denote empty spaces. The concept of zero is discovered in 628 AD by Brahmacuta in India. In his book Corrected Treatise of Brahma, he writes, "Two positives is positive, two negatives negative." Of a positive and a negative, is there difference? If they're equal, it is zero. Or consider pi. The existence of pi is first conceived in Greece and China. Greek mathematician Archimedes tried to calculate the value of pi in his book, The Measurement of the Circle. He started with the perimeter of a hexagon, doubling the number until he got to 96 sides to approximate the value of pi. Chinese mathematician Liu Hui worked with 12-sided polygons. And computed all the way to the perimeter of 3,072-sided polygon, getting the answer that pi is roughly equal to 3.1416, calling it the circle rate. In 1706, mathematician William Jones officially introduced the name of pi. In 1761, mathematician Johann Lambert proved that pi is an irrational number. Aside from pi and zero, we also have special integers like number 137 in math. It looks like an ordinary number following 136 and preceding 138. It is the 33rd prime number out of everything we see on the screen. We might ask, why is it special? Physicist Leon M. Letterman is particularly infatuated by this number. Writing in his book *The God Particle*, if the universe is the answer, what is the question? That 137 is also related to the probability that an electron will emit or absorb a photon. In the Bohr model. The innermost electron of an atom has the speed of 137, orbiting just below the speed of light. Going past 138 would be impossible. 137 is also the fine structure constant, a dimensionless physical constant. Physicist Richard Feynman writes: There is a most profound and beautiful question associated with the observed coupling constant. It is one of the greatest damn mysteries of physics. A magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say the hand of God wrote the number, and we don't know how He pushed this pencil. We know what kind of a dance to do experimentally to measure this number very accurately, but we don't know what kind of dance to do on the computer to make this number come out without putting it in secretly. Equation-wise, we have something like Fermat's last theorem, of which the mathematician famously proposed in 1636, stating the equation x to the power of n plus y to the power of n equals z to the power of n has no whole number solution if n is greater than two. In the 1700s, Leonhard Euler proved that the equation x to the power of three plus y to the power of three equals z to the power of three, and x to the power of four plus y to the power of four equals z to the power of four have no integer solutions. In 1857. Ernest Kummer proved this for all exponents up to 100. The famous Fermat's last theorem is finally proved in 1994 by Andrew Wiles in a 150 pages long published paper of seven years research, initially called elliptic curves and Galois representations. Our favorite equation has to be Euler's theorem. It is proposed by mathematician Leonhard Euler from Basel, Switzerland. He is one of the most prolific mathematicians in history, pioneering topology. Analytic number theory, mechanics, fluid dynamics, optics, astronomy, and music theory. He is also referred to as the Cyclops by Frederick the Great of Germany because his right eye is almost blind and his left eye is later on affected by a cataract. Euler's theorem states: e to the power of i times pi plus one equals zero. This equation unifies the five most important constants of mathematics, namely zero, one, pi, e, and i. It is 
the only function who is its own derivative and its own integral. You can also get a numbered version by substituting x equals pi, writing exponent i times pi equals cosine pi plus i times sine pi. It is hard not to notice the profound beauty behind the economy and the harmony of this equation. Everything works out perfectly. This equation is also the elected most beautiful equation of all time by magazine Mathematical Intelligencer in 1988. Our personal favorite is the Lorentz equation proposed by meteorologist Edward Lorentz that tries to explain the phenomenon of chaos. Most equations that enter our discussion deal with fixed values. However, the real world operates in a nonlinear fashion. For example, nonlinearity rises when one cell signals another cell to stop working or start working harder. In aerodynamics, the equation becomes nonlinear when air turns into a moving object rather than staying as a passive medium. The Lorentz equation provides chaotic solutions for certain parameter values and initial conditions. Lorentz equation looks like the following. In this equation, x, y, z represents numerical values of system states. T represents time. Beta, sigma, rho are system parameters. When you plot the Lorentz equation, it resembles a dynamic figure 8, or more imaginatively, it looks like a butterfly. Finally, what makes mass beautiful is form, but form is not always static. Euclid's Element is probably the most famous book in geometry. It is a set of treaties consisting of 13 books published in 300 BCE. It covers fundamental aspect of geometry, going from plane geometry in two-dimensional space to solid geometry in three-dimensional space. Form is fixed in ge Euclidean geometry. Philosopher Kant once thought that it represents the infallible knowledge about the universe. However, we can also imagine geometries whose curvature varies from place to place. They can be two-dimensional, three-dimensional, or even of higher dimensions. Gauss was the first mathematician to understand the concept of varying curvature in two-dimensional space, and his student Bernhard Riemann extended the concept to higher dimensions in 1854. For geometries of constant curvature, we have elliptic, Euclidean, and hyperbolic. When we translate that into shapes of the universe, very interesting possibilities arise. Of course, we also have geometries whose curvature varies. This thought presumably inspired Einstein when he conceived of his theory of special relativity in 1905 when he thought about space and time. When we consider something as beautiful, what does the experience imply? If we remove the constraints of cultural definitions, maybe, just maybe, we can see landscapes even more vast and up the beyond.